Welcome. In this course, we are looking at the System Security Certified Practitioner, also known as SSCP. This lecture is based off of the book, System Security Certified Practitioner, the Official Study Guide, Second Edition. ISBN 978-111-9542-940. A lot of the graphics and content in these video lectures are all taken out of this book. I'm assuming that you have this book. These video lectures are just to kind of reinforce concepts discussed within this book. Lesson eight, hardware and system security. We have four main objectives. We're focusing on domain seven, system and application security. The four main objectives we're gonna be working on in this or this lesson is going to be identify and analyze malicious code and activity, implement operate endpoint device security, operate and configure cloud security, and operate and secure virtual environments. Those are going to be our, the main, uh, four main focal points for this lecture. Our book jumps right on in talking about infrastructure security, about baseline management. So first of all, in order to keep the organization information secure, we have to have a baseline. We have to be able to manage those baselines. We have to have a comparison that we can compare current standing against that baseline. That way we can see if any abnormal uh, action items are occurring. If we know that our systems operate at this level and then the next day, system utilization is above what we would expect, that lets us know, hey, we have something that we need to drill down into. So one of the areas is infrastructure. How do we define infrastructure? Infrastructure is going to be the hardware and software that runs our technology. It's not just the switches, the cabling, the routers, but it's also the application. It's also the operating systems. Not just that, as our technology has been growing, so has our variations of what gets plugged into our infrastructure. Things like the Internet of Things or other IoT devices, our smart devices, any type of sensors or uh, logical controllers, our thermostats, anything that provides a connection to that infrastructure opens up that infrastructure to some security concerns. That's why understanding that baseline is so crucial. So you need to know how to be able to validate and confirm those baselines. It's not so much did we take a baseline, can we confirm that is the expectation. This allows us to at least start getting that understanding of what our baseline is. Next we have to understand how to use that baseline. And essentially where our baseline information is being able to look at current system and compare it back to the baseline and see the side-by-side -side comparison. Our book brought up a very uh, an interesting topic, infrastructure at a managed baseline. And basically this view starts with the lowest level of physical device you can use. The computers, um, phones, printers, and from there you can span out the control, you can add the capacity, the connections, the utilities, the connections, the infrastructure, the core infrastructure, and so forth. That allows us to look at our complete infrastructure for the organization. Our book brought up a really interesting thing when it deals with people. Remember that safety first. And the book has brought up the fact that depending on the culture and the organization, it may not always be human safety first. However, because this is more geared towards a ISC exam, ISC is always pro human safety first. The last thing in this section that our book had brought up was supply chain security. What is interesting is when we deal with any type of organization, if they are manufacturing or if they're just a support service, they have to have a supply chain. 
they have to have the ability to resupply their current inventory, whether it be people, whether it be goods and services, it, it doesn't matter. So supply and chain security is one of those areas that we need to be able to protect. Are we able to get our resources that we need when we need it? And that is what supply chain security is all about. So when we brought up things like supply chain, we brought up infrastructure, we talked about physical security, all of that directly ties back to access control. Who has the ability to access content? And part of that is the identity authentication and management systems. As we have started seeing a larger cloud growth, we start seeing things like identity as a service, IDAAS. And this is things like taking an Active Directory or LDAP or other identity service uh, authenticators and putting them into a cloud. That way we are able to authenticate against them regardless of where our uh, devices are at. It's important to realize that all physical connections are crucial to safety. If we're dealing with computers, if we're dealing with equipment, we have to make sure one that they're secure. We also have to make sure that the devices are secure and be safe to use. I actually worked with one organization that had modified a scanning uh, device for uh, medical imaging and they it was kind of janky and it was held together with tape and string and well, a lot of duct tape and a lot of le electrical tape. If you hold the uh, device wrong, it would shock the user. Part of that was they needed the device to function. They needed the device to be physically secure, but it wasn't safe for the users to actually operate. So we have to understand that safety plays a huge role in this. Access control need uh, for safety and security should be extended to everyone in the organization. It's not just the staff members. It's to staff members, it's to stakeholders, C-level executives, everyone across the board should be responsible for safety and security. If it is a janitor, they need to be responsible for their level of safety and security. Security guard, maid, doesn't matter. Everyone in the organization should be held accountable and should not be allowed to mitigate or transverse any of the security controls. Part of this goes back to the no loan zones. And the book describes those as zones where uh, individuals could be alone. There shouldn't be any instances where workers should be alone, especially with core infrastructure or any type that requires access control. That way, it's not on a single individual because they don't have direct access. If everything requires two or at least two individuals, it actually adds to the concept of a layered defense. When we're dealing with access control, that needs to actually extend to our vendors as well. So the sources of the supply or the design or the product techniques, all of this should be able to have the organization share with their vendors the insights that they're going to be needing and will be doing for verification and validation of anything that they are working with collectively. The vendor, the, the ones that are actually included in the supply chain that are providing goods and services to the organization will also have to list how they're verifying and validating their employees, their workers, anyone from the vendor's side that has direct access to the organization's infrastructure. Part of this will also be letting the organization know that they need to uh, send to all of their vendors, all of their suppliers, that you trust them and you trust your customers and that verification will be taking place. So when we say access control extended to everyone, anyone that has direct access to the data of the organization must be verified and validated for their identity 
part of that's going to be the AAA process, uh, authentication, authorization, and accountability, whether you're directly involved in the organization or if you're just a vendor supplying goods and services to that organization. So how does this work in a cloud-based environment? So there are a few different types of clouds and the cloud boundaries. Private cloud is pretty uh, common, public clouds, hybrid clouds, community clouds. Uh, but we also have a gov cloud. The gov clouds are tailored to meet specific federal guidelines of the US government. A community cloud is established to provide cloud services to a group of users that can be defined as users with the same information or similar purpose. That's a community cloud. Hybrid clouds are cloud systems that have a mix of both public and private characteristics. Particular organizations may have a need to host some business processes locally, while the private cloud system that is fully under its control while still using some public cloud services for other business processes. So that def means we have to look at what's a public cloud. A, pub a public cloud are cloud systems in which multiple unrelated customers are hosted on the cloud provider system. This will share hardware, software, applications, resources, and other uh, services provided by the cloud provider. These customers may be competitors, they may be partners in business, it could be different types of organizations, but it's open to everyone. Typically, public cloud will have a service level agreement, SLA, and this will define the privacy requirements that will separate the individuals. A good example of a public cloud system might be Microsoft Azure or Amazon's uh, web services. Google also has their platform that is not as common, but it, it's also out there. Basically, with public cloud, you end up with these public providers giving you access. Let's say you have uh, Nike shoes using AWS. Well, Nike's competitors can also use AWS. There will be an agreement that says what will be segmented so that one organization or one company cannot access information from another one. So there are privacy boundaries. But this will all be managed through the public provider. So with the Amazon example, it would be managed through Amazon's AWS. If we're using Microsoft Azure, it'll be managed through Microsoft. And that actually contradicts how private clouds are used. Private clouds are just that. They are private. The organization will host their own cloud services. These are cloud systems that one organization has sole and dedicated use of. It is completely private. While some private cloud deployments can use service providers such as Microsoft and Amazon to provide the full uh, secure private services to the customer and guaranteed uh, privacy, you can have a contract with the public cloud providers that will dedicate certain resources to your private cloud. Essentially, who manages it? Who controls it? That's going to dictate if it's private or public. If you have complete, full control of managing and accessing hardware, it's private. If uh, you have some form of agreement or contract about managing of hardware, it's more than likely going to be public. So now that we have a basic understanding of cloud services, we can start talking about infrastructure basics and threat modeling. Here we have an example from the book. Here's a traditional data center that is actually layered. Access, aggregation, core layer, and the access layer will actually have the racks of equipment and so forth. This is a pretty common infrastructure. Nice thing is each one of these will have firmware, each one of these will have storage, each one of these will have chips and electronic boards and 
controls and software and bootstraps and so forth. Each one of these might have an operating system as well. Each one of those devices is a potential threat. If there is software, if there is firmware, if there is BIOS, if there's an operating system, it can be taken over. It can be hijacked and used against the organization. Essentially, the message should be very clear. Everywhere you look, the hardware has embedded firmware, software, or other control parameters. All of this must be protected from corruption or even attack or being exploited. With that in mind, we need to look closer at a few vulnerabilities that might happen along the way. From the lowest level chip to the data center and past the data center. One of the key questions that we have to ask ourselves is, with any type of vulnerability or exploit, how are we able to find them? For example, how would we detect someone that was running a zero-day exploit against a system that we are trying to manage? Zero-day being an, an unknown exploit up until this point. How can we provide protection when we're not even sure of all of the vulnerabilities that are out there. And essentially what we have to do is we do that via layered defenses. And we have to look at the vulnerabilities at certain areas, at certain levels. So for example, we need to look at hardware vulnerabilities. And that is, first and foremost, harder being physical assets. Remember that all physical assets need to be protected as well. It's not just about theft. It's not just about uh, them walking off, but they need to be updated. They need to have the, the BIOS versions updated, the firmware versions updated. They need to be kept pretty current. One of the biggest things that I see constantly is I may deploy, you know, a 200 phone system, yet no one ever discusses the plan to keep the phones upgraded or up up to date with the firmware that's on the phone. I actually recently was working with a uh, organization. I was doing a vulnerability assessment and we did a network uh, scan of their entire network and we found out that the phone, phone system and the phones themselves were actually had not been updated in almost 12 years and we actually had the phone server, actually someone had uh, hijacked and was placing calls through their phone server and it was being billed to the client. Not just that, we had one phone that was actually taking and listening to phone conversations and then FTPing the data outside to a third party. Technically was a data breach and the organization had no clue how long this had been going on. Uh, we did fix it, however, after that, they were like, we don't understand how this happened. And part of that was understanding that the phones were endpoint devices. They needed to be treated like an endpoint device, meaning scheduled updates, scheduled vulnerability assessments, and so forth. So when we're looking at our hardware, it's not just about physical control. It's not just about locking them up. It's not just about fencing them off. It's actually about the software that runs on that hardware, the firmware, the BIOS, and, and again, scheduling those out so that they can actually be uh, updated on a more regular basis. So one thing that our chapter brought up was this trusted platform modules, TPMs. TPMs very often work with uh, embedded systems to improve cryptography or encryption services for hardware. One special feature of the TPM is its ability, while it may not have dedicated software uh, access, it can actually force the hardware to brick itself or encrypt itself so it becomes less appealing for people to steal. Since we brought up software and we brought up firmware, we have to look at firmware vulnerabilities. First and foremost, firmware has its own unique vulnerabilities which you need to take into account when we are looking at hardening our systems and other infrastructure. 
one there is a life cycle if we're looking at a switch if we're looking at a router if we're looking at a server if we're looking at a raid controller card all of them have firmware all of them have a life cycle for updating that firmware that also means that we need to be getting in the routine of looking at and upgrading firmware as needed all networking communication firmware is a target if you're able to bypass the software of a router you may be gain, may be able to gain access to the router so the ability to protect the firmware is becoming increasingly important essentially I've seen phishing emails saying you have this product you need to upgrade your firmware and the firmware was actually bad firmware it was compromised firmware so first of all when you're looking at firmware if you're looking at software looking at patches whatever the case may be only download content from trusted resources and the trusted resource should be the manufacturer if you have a Dell raid controller card download it from Dell you have an LSI controller card you download it from LSI if you're dealing with uh, Windows Server you download the patches directly from Microsoft if you have a Linux server you download the patches from a trusted repository there is no taking shortcuts here uh, I've actually encountered an issue where I needed a DLL keep in mind this was probably 20 years ago early 2000s I needed a DLL to get an application to work so you had these massive DLL uh, databases that you could download any DLL uh, you wanted from the internet well turns out the DLLs were molested they were not untouched they actually had malware in them but organizations barely at that point didn't care or didn't know any better so they actually just downloaded the malware and use the DLLs and it caused long-term issues one of the things to take away from this section is you never want to deploy devices using factory settings I was once deploying a free PBX VoIP server I had to connect to the internet to download updates so the first thing while I was going through the installation process download the upgraded packages just me connecting the box to the internet it was taken over within seconds so I quickly learned very very quickly when I do that no I, I do not connect to the internet to, to download the software I do that very last I go through the basic uh, setup process change the default settings change the default passwords after the machine boots after all of the settings have been changed then I can download the new uh, update settings I can uh, download the new updates the new firmware the new module updates and so forth but only after I've changed all of those default settings firmware is a form of operating system even or a form of software it may not be as complex as a traditional operating system but it does provide basic features so since we talked about firmware we have to talk about operating systems vulnerabilities so you have to understand how malware interacts with your operating system whether it be Windows whether it be Linux whether it be Mac whether it be an embedded OS or so forth the two big types of malware we have to be aware of are going to be things like Trojan uh, horse malware that's things that can act like legitimate software just to be able to gain access to your system and then allow us for a back door to, to be accessed later by an attacker also we have root kits root kits are the ability to embed malicious code into core programs of the operating system that way they become harder to detect I've actually seen Internet Explorer get uh, infected pretty uh, often 
You can't uninstall Internet Explorer. It's built into Windows. But you can repair Internet Explorer and remove the rootkit from those core files. Essentially, all of this is about protecting your OS, keeping it up to date, keeping it running, keeping it maintained. We've already discussed the importance of ensuring that updates are ran, but understanding where we obtained those updates are also equally important. Lastly, we have a concept known as software orphaned. Microsoft actually orphans its software after X amount of years of protecting. For example, Windows 7 is no longer supported by Microsoft. It's now orphaned. Well, realistically, companies shouldn't be using orphaned software. However, sometimes it happens. I have one client that is needing to use Windows XP because they have software that only works with XP. The compatibility function of newer operating systems don't work. So they're stuck with that orphan software. The best that can be done is they try to keep the software up to date, they try to keep the computer clean the best they can, and that's really all they can do. So since we're talking infrastructure, we have to end with one major area for vulnerabilities, and that's gonna be virtual machines. So virtual machines are great. They are standalone, they can be spun up, they can be deleted on the fly, they're easy. Problem is, what happens when they have to connect to the network? They will use a software-defined network or a software-defined NIC, and that will actually connect through the hardware. Well, the second you do that, they are vulnerable. So they need to be treated like a regular computer because essentially that is what they are. So what's interesting is when we're talking about VMs, we're talking about operating systems and applications, we need to understand how we can find vulnerabilities or exposures. If you Google CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, there is a list of exploits that are out there or exposures that are out there that need to be protected against. So it's not just about VMs, it's not just about software. Almost any type of device that has any type of coding is vulnerable. And as people or organizations find these vulnerabilities, they report them as CVEs. So since you're talking about virtual machines, we need to talk about how virtual machines actually operate. Well, a virtual machine will operate on top of a hypervisor. Hypervisors come in two main types, type one and type two. Type one is bare metal, meaning it will load a specific software on the hardware of the device. From there, the hardware will actually initiate and manage the VMs. That is slightly different than a type two hypervisor. Type two hypervisors, the hardware has to have an operating system already there, like Windows 10. And then on top of the operating system, the virtualization application has to be ran. For example, virtual PC or VMware Workstation, or if you're running a Mac, um, Parallel or things that software like that. Type one, bare metal, the virtual machines sit right on top of that. With type two, bare metal, an operating system, and then the operating system will install the hypervisor and then the VM sit on top of the hypervisor. So a virtual machine is a collection of resources, processor cycles, memory, storage, network connectivity, and so forth. The interesting thing is with certain cloud-based systems, we have virtual storage. Uh, AWS, for example, you have to pay for storage. On Microsoft Azure, you have to pay for storage as well. What's interesting is we don't call them virtual disks anymore. They're called blobs. And you can have a small blob, a, a medium blob, a long blob, and so forth. These are just clever ways of saying storage. Virtual machines need to be configured correctly 
just as if they were regular physical machines. What is interesting is when you dedicate resources to a virtual machine, you can actually over allocate. If a, machine, uh, a server has 24 gigs of memory and you actually allocate six virtual machines to have 10 gigs each, well, that's 60 gigs of memory, even though you only have 24. It's the assumption of you don't have all the machines running at 100% with all the resources at a given time. So this is over allocation. So you can do that. So virtual machines differ from containers in that a virtual machine is a dedicated full operating system. A container is not. A container is bare minimum core files to actually process or do the task that it was created to do. Lastly, like I've said before, VMs are just like any other software, any other device, they need to be protected just the same. If these are VMs that you're going to be running on a long period of time, you need to treat them like a regular computer. Do they have antivirus? Things like that. They need to have the same level of protection you would a physical machine. Moving forward, now that we talked about the software, we talked about the firmware, we talked about hardware, we have to talk about the network. The network actually allows for sharing of resources, typically called a service fabric. All of this is about being able to share those resources. When computing devices first came out, they were all standalone. However, nowadays, that's not realistic. Most computers have some form of network connectivity. Your smart devices have network connectivity. Your refrigerators have network connectivity. All of these types of devices now belong on the network. They can share resources that enrich and better our lives. But the problem with that is we need to make sure that they are protected, that they are secured. So essentially, when we're doing like a risk mitigation plan, you should let the plan drive your needs. Use that to identify the timelines for prompt detection and response of possible malicious content. Again, just because you may not see why a hacker would break into your refrigerator doesn't mean that they're not trying to. So protection is going to be needed for all types of devices. Part of this also brings in the concept of layered defenses, meaning you don't just have a single layer. You have multiple layers. That way, if a breach occurs, they may get through one layer. You have other layers that are there so that it makes it harder to break into. Our book continues on to talk about IDSs and IPSs. Intrusion Detection Systems, IDSs, and Intrusion Prevention Systems, IPSs. They come in two main flavors, host-based or network-based. Essentially, is the software running on the individual host protecting that host, or are they running on the network, protecting the entire network? These types of services and appliances are not the same. An IDS looks at and monitors the network. An IPS actively looks at the network and can actually perform action, not just monitor. There's pros and cons for both, but IDSs are probably one of the more, more widely uh, deployed technologies because of cost. You can set them to monitor and alert when necessary. That means the actual action has to be taken by a individual once a alert is sent. So let's go ahead and let's talk about home and mobile based devices. BYOD is probably one of the more common device types out there, that is when your company allows you to bring your own device into work. However, this is not the only type of management system out there. We have company-owned personal enabled devices, COPE. That is where your company will issue you a device that you can also use for personal use. You have a CYOD, which basically means choose your own device. 
the company will actually purchase the device for you, but it's company owned, but you're going to pick out what you want to use. You have a BYOI or BYOC, bring your own infrastructure or bring your own cloud. Some companies don't want to pay for a cloud-based system. They'll allow the individuals to use other public cloud systems like Dropbox, for example. And that way, the individual workers will have their own individually managed cloud storage systems. So we did not talk about MDM, Mobile Device Management. Well, with all of the other things here, laptops and tablets and other technology that is being implemented, we have to have a way to manage everything, including our mobile phones that are provided by the company. MDM allows us to manage our mobile devices. If uh, you have an iPhone and you set up iCloud on your iPhone, but you set it up using a personal account instead of your business account, and the worker leaves, what does the business do? The business may have a device that is now bricked because it's tied to an account that they don't own. Well, MDM actually allows for managing of these devices so that companies have better control of those devices. Our next section is going to be talking about malware and exploiting the infrastructure's vulnerability. So what is malware? Malware is essentially malicious code. How can we classify malware? By what the code is trying to do. Is it trying to do pop-up ads? Is it trying to collect data on you? Is it trying to hold content ransom? Is it trying to reproduce uh, file access? Well, if it's holding stuff ransom, that's ransomware. Ransomware is a type of malware. Uh, it could be a virus that's trying to access certain files and allow people to gain access to your system. That's a type of malware. If it's trying to do adware, it's a type of malware. So we can define or classify malware based off of what it's trying to do. Is it trying to generate network traffic? Is it trying to launch web content? Is it trying to upload files? Is it trying to spy on you? Is it trying to move or modify content? All of those are different groups or different classifications of malware. One of the fun parts with all of this is sometimes malware can actually possibly look at the procedural misuse of built-in capabilities. You can actually develop ransomware to use the built-in encryption in Windows. And the ransomware takes the encryption key that Windows generates and copies it to the person, the attacker, and deletes it off the current system. That way, the ransomware didn't have to create the encryption, it's just using the built-in capabilities of the platform, of the operating system. Essentially, regardless of the type of malware, basic protection or basic recommendation is multi-factor user identification combined with the appropriate access controls, both administrative, technical, and physical, and is there a foundation of any well-IT managed security program? All of that means testing, user awareness, user training, verification, training, the training never goes away. I keep saying training because it's one of those important areas. So how do we counter malware threats? First one, user training. First and foremost, make sure your users are trained on how to spot basic malware threats like phishing emails. Another thing is keeping both the system and infrastructure up to date. Not just having antivirus, but actually making sure the antivirus and anti-malware are scanning on a regular basis. Not just are they scanning on a regular basis, but is someone looking through the logs, ensuring that the systems are cleaned appropriately. 
That also includes things like monitoring the system and infrastructure for any issues, inspecting the operating system, inspecting the infrastructure for any known uh, issues on a regular basis helps secure the environment. Looking at common vulnerability and exposures, the CVEs for the core components of your environment also just play a huge role in that. Realistically, a quarterly review of critical systems to ensure that they are secure, to ensure that they're actually operating as intended, and to validate that there's no new content or malware or exploits or vulnerabilities that are out there that might target your organization or your environment. All of this goes back to user training and defense in layers, defense in depth. There should not be a single layer of protection. Multiple layers of protection is the only way to ensure the security of the organization. So moving on, we have privacy and secure browsing. Private versus security browsing. Private browsing is the ability to browse where information about the user, identity, history, and any other type of inner data is not kept, is not saved. It is kept confidential. Uh, browsers doing uh, in con uh, incognito mode, for example. That is different from secure or security browsing. Secure browsing is your browsing habits. How you actually browse the network, how you browse the internet, how you browse resources, and ensuring that they are kept secure. Two additional concepts that were kind of lightly touched in this section were understanding that the main internet uses web browsers. If you're looking at the dark web, we have a Tor browser, T-O-R. Tor is allowing us to access the bottom part of the internet or the dark part of the internet. That provides other web content that will be able to be browsed. But in order to browse the dark web, you need a Tor browser, not a web browser. Web browsers browse websites on the main internet. Tor browses sites that are on the dark web. Lastly, we have VPN-based technology. VPN is a virtual private network that allows us to basically encrypt our network traffic so that our ISP cannot read what we're trying to do. We can tunnel between our device and the endpoint of the VPN so that no one in between can see what we're trying to do. Maybe you want to view content that's illegal in your country or that's banned in your country. Well, you can tunnel outside of your country using a VPN and you can make it appear that you're actually located in a different location, tunneling through the network to point that you are at a different location. That's what VPNs are used for. So one concept that is getting a little scary is the sin of aggregation. When we look at data as a whole, some data may be protected, some data may not be protected. Some may be classified, some may not be classified. So data classification, data categorization, how we categorize and classify information that we're trying to access. The thing is, we can actually determine a lot of information about an individual by what they're looking at, by what they're browsing. So this is how we understand data aggregation by looking at what an individual is looking through and what may not be there. So it's not always what's there, it's also what is not there. So ensuring that we are browsing securely, but we're also browsing safely are two major concerns. Are we browsing in incognito mode when we are browsing specific sites while at work? Are we protecting our browsing habits while at Starbucks on free Wi-Fi? Those are things to consider. Ultimately, end user awareness and training prevents most types of attacks. Any type of real threat can be throttled 
by basic user awareness and training. If users are better equipped to actually spot uh, types of attacks like a phishing attempt, then the organization is probably better off at throttling those types of attacks because those users have been trained. So how do we update the threat model? Threat modeling is using information gathered through assessments and updating our threat model based off of our vulnerability assessments. So essentially we're going to be reflecting further consideration of vulnerabilities and potential countermeasures based off of what we find. Normally we're looking at vulnerabilities. We weigh them against the risk management strategy. We weigh them also against occurrence likelihood. I'm in Las Vegas. The likelihood of a, a tsunami hitting us is very low. So we don't even bother to plan for it because again, the risk of it actually occurring is so little that we can say that we don't need to worry about it. Once we look at the likelihood of the real events occurring, the vulnerabilities that might actually be exposed, we can actually choose and apply the correct countermeasures. Then we verify those countermeasures and we test them on a regular or annual basis to ensure that those countermeasures are actually providing the level of protection that we were expecting. The countermeasures in mind must actually be useful, but they also must actually do what we are thinking that they're going to do. If you don't treat the countermeasure as the hammer in your hand while making every problem into a nail, you need to actually whack. Countermeasures aren't going to fix every single thing. You need to look at the most likely to occur and you mitigate them the best you can. Security is not 100%. Security is a best effort. Do the due diligence and do care. But also, you can learn from the experience of others. However, don't always assume that others' situations are always going to be similar to your own. I've encountered several issues where I was dealing with an exchange issue and everyone said my problem was X, but I knew my situation wasn't the same. So through enough research and troubleshooting, I was able to fix my issue, which was actually issue Y. They were similar, but not identical. So you need to ensure that you don't become a slave to other people. Just because they tell you the best way or their way of doing things doesn't mean it's the best for your environment or your organization or your structure. The bottom line is, as your threat model matures, you need to re-examine it. You need to look at the threat services, the boundary between the security zone and the next security zone. You need to look at risk mitigation, risk assessment, your insurance plan. You need to be able to do a impact analysis, prioritize the critical systems, prioritize likelihood of occurrence, actually prioritize the risk of the key infrastructure for the organization. That's done through a business impact analysis, BIA. The important here is we need to look at the actual threat model and update it accordingly. And we update it based off of these different plans. BIA, risk assessment, risk mitigation, our insurance, all of those allow us to make choices about risk. What risk we want to accept, what risk we want to transfer, which it to actually bound or contain or limit or even accept. Some risk may just be acceptable. It all depends on your organization. Lastly, managing system security. Studies of risk management and risk mitigation. We are looking at real-time versus near real-time incident information. Is our organization set up to monitor our devices? Can we see what's really happening in our network right now, real-time or near real-time? SIEMs, S-I-E-Ms, are event management monitoring. Our monitors, 
play a huge role in here. Are we getting indicators? Are we getting warning messages? When issues arise, if we see a core switch go down, are we getting an alert? We need to understand that information about our network plays a huge role in our response. Are we able to look at the current status of ongoing mitigation projects and activities to see where we are at? Being able to look at reports, being able to look at system health, being able to look at user health, user uh, access, logged in users, time of user login, things like that give us the ability to better protect our network. The point is that not every organization needs a security information management system, but there needs to be something in place for the management team or the security team to be able to quickly assess how the organization is doing in security, in networking, in infrastructure management. There needs to be a way to quickly see how many PCs are infected? How many PCs got the latest updates? We need to have a dashboard for being able to manage our organization. Mom and pop shops may not have the ability to do this. However, there are open source tools out there, open source sims, that give you those dashboards to provide better level of security. Thank you. If you have any questions or concerns about anything throughout this lecture, please reach out to me. Again, part of this only really works if we have some form of back and forth. Remember, the goal here is data retention, and we do that by talking about what we've read, what we've discussed through our live lectures, and things like that. So do not hesitate to reach out if you have questions or concerns. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you throughout the rest of this video series.